This is Cambridge IGCSE for paper four extended, specimen paper for examination from 2023. Question number one, element X can undergo the following physical changes. A1, name each of the numbered physical changes shown in figure 1.1. 1 .1. So arrow number one shows you that it's a conversion from the solid state to the liquid state. So this is nothing. Arrow number two shows you that it's a conversion from gas to liquid. So it's actually condensation. Arrow number three shows you that sorry, shows you that it's a conversion from liquid to solid. So that will be freezing. And arrow number four is the conversion from liquid to gas. So that will be boiling or evaporation. Now, two. One difference between boiling and evaporation is the rate at which the processes occur. State one other difference between boiling and evaporation. So, what are the differences between boiling and evaporation? You can talk about, let's say, for example, the temperature at which both processes occur, respectively. So, boiling occurs only at specific temperatures. Like, for example, water only boils at 100 degrees Celsius basically room, tem room temperature and pressure conditions. So occurs at a specific temperature. And then regarding evaporation, that actually occurs at any temperature over a range of temperatures. Meanwhile, what else can you talk about? You can talk about the occurrence in which is it occurring on the surface? Is it occurring throughout the liquid? So for boiling, it is actually happening throughout the liquid. Whereas for evaporation, it's only occurring on the surface of the liquid. All right. So in your real exam, please write them in sentences. I'm just writing it in a table form so that it's clearer for you to see the differences. Okay. Now, B. Describe the separation, arrangement, and motion of particles of element X in the solid state. So this question is about separation, arrangement, and motion of solid states. So what's the separation of particles in solid state that will be touching? Right. Very little separation. Arrangement, it's packed and regular. Whereas for motion, how are the particles behaving in terms of motion in this particular state that will be vibrating? All right, moving on to C. Element X is a group 3 metal. It burns in air to form an oxide X2O3. Write a simple equation for this reaction. Now, when you see a particular substance burns in the air, oftentimes you are referring to the reaction with oxygen gas. So the formula of oxygen gas is O2. So essentially, X is reacting with O2 to form X2O3. So that's the first mark. The second mark is the balancing, which is have a look at this equation. So your oxygen number on the left hand side, there are actually two oxygen atoms. And on the right hand side, there's actually three oxygen particles. So you have to balance them by finding the appropriate coefficient to be put in front of the reactants and products. So the best way to do that is to figure out the lowest common multiple. So two and three, the lowest common multiple is actually six. So what you need to do is put a three in front of O2, which makes it six altogether for oxygen on the left, and then put a two in front of X2O3, which makes the total number of oxygen atoms six. Now, because we put a two, 
on the product side, which means that X currently has four ions, right? There are actually four X ions. So you have to put a four in front of X on the left-hand side. So that's the balance equation. That's your second mark. Moving on to the next question. Two, magnesium, calcium, and strontium are group two elements. A, complete table 2.1 to show the electronic configuration of a calcium atom. So you have the shell, which is the first, second, third, and fourth, and then the number of electrons. If you refer to your periodic table, the calcium and the calcium atom, the proton number is actually two, sorry, it's actually 20. Right, which means that the electronic configuration will be two, eight, eight, two. Right, so there will be two, eight, eight, two, respectively. Moving on to B, describe how the electronic configuration of a strontium atom is one similar to the electronic configuration of a calcium atom. Now, strontium, as mentioned in the question, it's a group two element. So, which means that, well, if we have the same number of outer shell electrons. Because they belong to the same group. Moving on to two, different from the electronic configuration of a calcium atom. So what's different about that? If you refer to the periodic table, strontium belongs at a lower position, which means in a, in a higher period. Right. So which means that if we have, a, have the outer electron in a different shell, right. So strontium has the outer, sorry, two outer electrons in the, so it's located in period five, so it's in the fifth shell. All right, moving on to the next question. C, calcium reacts with cold water to form two products. A colorless gas P, which pops a lighted splint, a weakly alkaline solution Q, which turns milky when carbon dioxide is bubbled through it. One, name gas P. Now P is a gas that pops a lighted splint, which means that this is hydrogen gas. Make sure that you name it. All right. Two, identify the ion responsible for making solution Q alkaline. Now, what, what ion is responsible for making solution alkaline? That will be the hydroxide ions. All right, three, suggest the pH of solution Q. So it's weakly alkaline, which means that it's above seven, but not too much. Right, so it's, you can give me maybe eight, nine, ten. All right. Four, write a simple equation for the reaction of calcium with cold water. So calcium reacts with cold water to form calcium hydroxide. So the formula of calcium hydroxide is Ca bracket. OH2. And then this reaction also produces hydrogen gas. So the formula for hydrogen gas is H2. So with that, let's balance the equation. This will be your first mark by having the translations correct. And then the second mark is by putting the correct coefficients. So as you can see, there are actually two oxygen atoms on the right-hand side, which means that you need to put a two in front of H2O on the left-hand side. 
And then now I believe that it's balanced. Let me double check. Yeah, it is balanced because as you can see, one calcium atom on the left and on the right, two oxygen particles on the left and on the right, and then four hydrogen particles on the left and on the right as well. All right, moving on to the next question. Magnesium reacts with chlorine to form magnesium chloride, MgCl2. Magnesium chloride is, a, is an ionic compound. One, complete the dot and cross diagram in 2.1 of the ions in magnesium chloride. Show the charges on the ions. All right. So, if you refer to the periodic table, magnesium is a having an electronic arrangement of 2A2 and then for chlorine the electron arrangement electronic configuration is 287 so how do they form these ions essentially magnesium has to donate two electrons to essentially chloride, sorry, chlorine atoms to form chloride. So this one will turn into 2, 8 for Mg2 plus. And then for chlorine, when it receives electrons, it will be having this particular electronic arrangement, electronic configuration, which is Cl minus. So let's draw that out. So magnesium is 2, 8, which means that you need to draw an outer shell with 8 electrons. So the two outer electrons are given to the chlorine atoms, and the charge is 2 plus. And then for the chlorine, when it turns into chloride, it is having a 2 comma 8 comma 8 as its electronic configuration so let's draw it out but do remember that one of the electrons in this shell is given by the magnesium atom just now so you could do it as a cross all right so draw seven electrons for chlorine normally and then adding an extra electron that comes from the magnesium so both of them are having a negative one charge so let me check the mark scheme real quick this is okay the first mark is the outer shelf of magnesium having eight electrons and then the second mark is chlorine having the outer shell with seven dots and one cross. And then also the last mark being a two plus charge on the magnesium and then also a minus one charge on the chloride. Moving on to the next question. One physical property typical of ionic compounds such as MgCl2 is that they are soluble in water. Give two other physical properties that are typical of ionic compounds. The keyword here is two other physical properties, which means that you shouldn't talk about solubility in water anymore. So you can, what you can talk about is, for example, high melting and boiling point. And also you can also mention about the ability to conduct electricity. in molten or aqueous solution state all right moving on to e aqueous silver nitrate is added to aqueous magnesium chloride a white precipitate forms right an ionic equation for this reaction include the state symbols so when you see the word silver specifically aqueous silver ions it reacts exclusively with chloride all 
right? And that forms the white precipitate, which is silver chloride. And the precipitate is in solid form. So that's the equation. Moving on to the next question, three. Copper is a transition element. It has variable oxidation states. A. State two other chemical properties of transition elements which make them different from group one elements. So you can talk about their ability to act as catalysts. Or maybe you can talk about their ability to form colored compounds. All right, slash ions, right, colored ions. So B, when copper two oxide is heated at 800 degrees Celsius, it undergoes the reaction shown by the equation. One, identify the changes in oxidation numbers of copper and oxygen in this reaction. Explain in terms of changes in oxidation numbers and why this is a redox reaction. So the change in oxidation number of copper went from plus 2 to plus 1. Right, the former compound is copper 2 oxide, and then the later compound is copper 1 oxide. So it's changing from plus 2 to plus 1. And then change in oxidation number of oxygen. So it went from a negative two, hence copper two oxide is neutral. And then having oxygen for the oxygen, this one. So this one is a particle, an uncharged particle will have oxidation number zero so it will be changing from negative two to zero right so why is this a redox reaction because the increase in oxidation number is actually oxidation and then the decrease in oxidation number is reduction. All right, so that will be three marks. Moving on to three, sorry, two. Calculate the volume of oxygen measured at RTP, which is formed when 1.60 grams of copper two oxide reacts as shown in the equation. So given that 1.60 grams of copper two oxide is used, and then we are trying to find the volume of oxygen. So we need to do, first of all, establish the theoretical mole ratio first, which is given in the equation. So of copper two oxide to oxygen gas, we can observe the coefficients, which is four to one ratio. And then given that we are using copper two oxide of about 1.60 grams, so we have to convert this to Number of moles first, which is taking 1.60 over the molar mass of copper two oxide. So you have to find it out by using your periodic table. So copper is 64, and then for oxygen is 16. So all together, it's 80. So 1.60 out of 80, that should be 0 0.02 moles. So from the equation, we are given that the theoretical mole ratio is 4 to 1 for these two substances. 
So you are currently using 0 0.02, which means that you are essentially using a fraction of 0 0.02 over 4. So the conversion factor is that, and then we have to find now for oxygen, the number of moles is actually 0 0.005. With that said, we are able to convert from number of moles to volume of oxygen now. So volume of oxygen is taking the number of moles multiplied by the molar volume. So with that, you have 0 0.12 as the answer. All right, so moving on to the next question. C, copper metal is obtained when scrap iron is added to aqueous copper 2 sulfate. 1. The reaction between iron and aqueous copper 2 sulfate is a displacement reaction. See why this displacement reaction takes place. Now, as you can see, you are adding iron, which is a metal, into an ionic compound that contains copper ions, right? Copper two ions. So these copper two ions get kicked out from the compound. It gets eliminated. It gets disqualified, essentially. All right, kicked out from the team. So what happens is, why is iron able to do that? simply because iron is simply a stronger candidate than copper. To be technical, that will be iron is more reactive than copper. All right, so that's the more accurate answer. Moving on to two, write a simple equation for the reaction between iron, iron, sorry, and copper to sulfate in its aqueous form. So, iron in a normal atomic state, atomic metal, reacts with copper to sulfate, which is CuSO4, is converted to, so iron is able to take over copper's position and be with sulfate ions, and as a result, copper gets kicked out. So that's the equation in this balance. Moving on to three, a displacement reaction is one method for obtaining copper metal from aqueous copper to sulfate. Identify another method for obtaining copper metal from aqueous copper to sulfate. The key word here is another method. So the typical ones that we actually do is just electrolysis, right? Electrolysis of copper to sulfate gets you copper metal. Moving on to four, sulfuric acid has many uses. A, sulfuric acid is a strong acid. One, define the term acid. So acids are just proton donors. Right? Two, define the pH, sorry, define the term strong acid. So strong acids are basically acids that are capable of completely dissociating in an aqua solution. So this is pretty straightforward. Moving on to the next question. B, dilute sulfuric acid is used to make salts known as sulfates. A method consisting of three steps is used to make zinc sulfate from zinc carbonate. Step one, add an excess of zinc carbonate to 20 cm cube of 0 0.4 mole per dm cube. Dilute sulfuric acid until the reaction is complete. Step two, filter the mixture. Step three, Heat the filtrate until a saturated solution forms and then allow it to crystallize. 
one, suggest two observations which show that the reaction is complete in step one. So this is a carbonic salt with acid reaction. Or should I say a metal carbonate reacting with an acid reaction? So what is the expected outcome? It should form high, not exactly, wait, this is forming a salt and also water and also carbon dioxide gas. So the at least observable observations are how the carbon dioxide gas is formed. So essentially, you will observe effervescence in terms of observation, but to show that the reaction is complete, effervescence would have stopped. And then also, what else? You see, your metal carbonate is getting converted into the salt. So essentially, it starts to dissolve and then it stops dissolving. So the solution of zinc carbonate stops. All right, two. See, why is it important to add an excess of zinc carbonate in step one? Well, because you want to ensure the limiting reagent is reacting completely, right? All of it is used up. So to ensure that all the acid is used up. Moving on to three, define the term saturated solution. So two parts, two marks. So it is a solution that can hold no more solute at a specific temperature. All right, moving on to four, name another zinc compound which can be used to make zinc sulfate from dilute sulfuric acid using this method. So what kind of zinc containing compounds can react with acid? Zinc oxide. And also, okay, the question only needs one, so you can also mention like for example, zinc hydroxide. So with that said, let's write zinc oxide. Now, five, suggest why this method would not work to make barium sulfate from barium carbonate and dilute sulfuric acid. Now, the problem is the method used here is for soluble salts. Right, look, filter the mixture, heat the filtrate until a saturated solution forms. This is for soluble salts. So, barium sulfate is an insoluble precipitate. So, it would not work at all. So, it's insoluble. Moving on to C, in a titration, a student asks 25.0 cubic centimeters of 0 0.200 mole per dm cube aqueous sodium hydroxide to a conical flask. The student then added a few drops of metal orange to the solution in the conical flask. Dilute sulfuric acid is then added to from a burette to the conical flask. The volume of dilute sulfuric acid needed to neutralize the aqueous sodium hydroxide was 20.0 cf cube. The reaction is shown by the equation. 1. State the color of metal orange in aqueous sodium hydroxide. Because this is an alkaline solution, so metal orange will be yellow. 2. Determine the concentration of the dilute sulfuric acid in gram per dm cube using the following steps. Calculate the number of moles of aqueous sodium hydroxide added to the conical flask.
so the clues given in the question based on aqueous sodium hydroxide is the fact that the student is using 25 cm cube and at 0 0.2 mole per dm cube. So to find number of moles, all you need to do is apply the formula of taking the volume multiplied by the concentration. But make sure that the volume is in dm cube. So it is 25.0. To convert that, we have to divide it by 1,000, multiply by the concentration. So with that, your answer is 0 0.005. Moving on to two, calculate the number of moles of dilute sulfuric acid added from the blue red. So the clues given here is the volume of sulfuric acid and the equation, which means that you need to utilize the equation. The theoretical mole given in the question is for sodium hydroxide to sulfuric acid. The theoretical mole is 2 to 1 ratio. So since you're using 0 0.05 moles of sodium hydroxide, it will mean that it is only a fraction of the theoretical mole ratio. So that's the conversion factor. Multiply by 0 0.05 divided by 2, which gets you 0 0.025. Oops, my bad. I realized that this one is missing a 0. So this one will be 0 0.00025. All right, 0 0.0. 0 0.0025, right? So it's 0 0.0025. Make sure you check your answers. Don't be like me and make mistakes regarding how many zeros are you copied. All right, moving on to the next one. Calculate the concentration of the dilute sulfuric acid in mole per liter cube. So continuation of this question. So we are given, as usual, the volume and also the number of moles. So we are trying to find concentration that will be taking the number of moles divided by volume. So it is 0 0.0025 divided by the volume in dm cube as usual. So it will be 0 0.02, which is 20.0 over 1,000. And then you can pretty much type this in your calculator or you want to do it manually. The answer should be 0 All right, moving on to the next question. Calculate the concentration of the dilute sulfuric acid in gram per dm cube. So now you want to convert mole per dm cube to gram per dm cube. So essentially, based on the dimensional analysis, which we said by looking at the units, you are trying to convert this particular unit into this particular unit. So what do you need to do about that? You need to multiply grams over mole. And this thing happens to be the molar mass of sulfuric acid. So the molar mass of sulfuric acid is, by looking at the periodic table, hydrogen is one, there's two of them which also for sulfur, it should be 32. 
and then oxygen is 16 times 4. So add them all together, you should be able to get 98. So with that said, let's take the concentration. Multiply by 98. So it's 0 0.125 multiplied by 98. The answer is 12.25. All right, moving on to the next question. Five, a student investigated the progress of the reaction between dilute hydrochloric acid, HCl, and an excess of large pieces of marble, CaCO3, using the apparatus shown in figure 5.1. A, a graph of the volume of gas produced in each time is shown in figure 5.2. One, state how the shape of the graph shows that the rate of reaction decreases as the reaction progresses. So if you observe this, as time progresses, what is happening to the graph? It's getting less deep, the gradient is decreasing. Moving on to Suggest why the rate of reaction decreases as the reaction progresses. Well, with that case, you have to somehow imagine this. You see, this reaction is progressing. As it progresses, right, you have less and less reactants, which means that in the same volume of hydrochloric acid, the number of reactive particles of H and Cl are essentially getting less and less as the reaction progresses. So essentially, you can talk about the concentration of HCl is decreasing, which is why the rate of reaction decreases as the reaction progresses, and eventually all the HCl reacted, which makes no more reaction. All right? Moving on to the next question, deduce at which time the reaction finishes. So the reaction finishes when there's no more new carbon dioxide gases are produced. So let's read that. The carbon dioxide gas production stops at 90, and then the timing will be 200 seconds. Moving on to the next question, B. The experiment is repeated using the same mass of smaller pieces of marble. All other conditions are kept the same. Draw a line on the grid in figure 5.2 to show the progress of the reaction using the smaller pieces of marble. So that will mean that the reaction should progress faster. But because you're using the same mass, means that the total product form remains unchanged. With that said, which means that your graph will be a steeper graph with a greater gradient, and it stops at 90 as well. All right, so this is the shape of the graph at a by using smaller pieces of marble. All right, moving on to the next question. The original experiment is repeated at a higher temperature. All other conditions are kept the same. The resulting increase in rate of reaction can be explained in terms of activation energy and collisions between particles. One, define the term activation energy. So, in is literally defined as the minimum amount of energy that the colliding particles must possess or must have to react. Two, explain why the rate of reaction increases when temperature increases in terms of activation energy and collision between particles. 
is a three mark question. Hence, you have to provide me at least three points in order to get full marks. So you can talk about, well, when temperature increases, the particles have more energy and move faster. And followed by that, it means more frequent collisions between particles. And because of that, a greater, actually not exactly because of that, but by having the particles gaining more energy, there's actually a greater percentage or fraction of particles possess energy greater than the activation energy. All right, moving on to the next question. Six alkynes and alkenes are homologous series of unsaturated hydrocarbons. All alkynes contain a carbon-carbon triple bond. Complete table 6.1 showing information about the first three alkynes. So let's count. The carbon atoms found in but one i is 4, or C4, and then the number of hydrogen atoms are 1 plus 2 plus 3, which means that altogether, 5 hydrogen atoms. And then the name for this particular molecule sees it as three carbons, which means that the prefix should be prop, and then followed by I, prop I. Now, B. Compounds in the same homologous series have the same general formula. Give two other characteristics of members of a homologous series. Now, members of a homologous series have the same functional group. As you can see here, all of them possess carbon, carbon triple bond. And then also, they have similar chemical properties as a result of having the same functional group, right? Because it is a source of the reactivity. So this leads to this. Or you can tell me about the difference between one member to another by a CH2 unit, or you can tell me like by 14, the mass, right? The difference in mass between members is 14. And then you can talk about also the trends in physical properties. Now two, deduce the general formula for alkynes Use the information from table 6.1 to help you. So what I can see is definitely CN. So how to generate 2 from 2, 4 from 3, and 5 from 4? That will be... multiplying by two my bet i just realized that it is h6 my bet All right the, the c4 h6 no wonder i felt that the formula is weird so I, what i see here is that all of these numbers are generated from multiple of n which is 2n so then minus two right two is generated from times two minus two take two times two, then minus two, then four is generated from three times two, minus two, right? So all of them possess this general formula, which is CnH2n minus two. Moving on to three, alkynes are unsaturated. Describe a test for unsaturation that will be bromine water. So the result is it decolorizes because it's the test for Unsaturation. Now, C. Ethene and but 2 in are alkenes 
one, draw the display formula of build to E. Now let's draw that. Yep. So build refers to four carbon atoms. E refers to there's a carbon-carbon double bond. Two refers to the location of this carbon-carbon double bond. It's located at carbon two and three. And then what's followed by that is drawing the correct number of bonds for each carbon atom, which is four. And then followed by filling in the spaces with hydrogen atoms. That's pretty much it. Let me double check the answer. Yep, that's correct. All right, moving on to two. Draw a dot and cross diagram to show a molecule of ethene. CH2, CH2. Show outer shell electrons only. Well, carbon is a group four element. Hydrogen only has one electron on its outer shell. So to draw a hydrogen, you need that, and also to draw a carbon, which is a larger atom. So the outer shell will be larger, and it will have four dots. So how can we form this particular structure? By Let me copy this real quick. There's four hydrogen atoms and two carbon atoms. So let's rearrange this one. So we see that there's a carbon-carbon double bond. So it means that there'll be two pairs of electrons for these two interaction. So let's put like that. Right, then followed by Hydrogen, one by one, hydrogen, one by one. Uh, wait for just a minute. Let me just, okay, let me just redraw this like that. And followed by, So that's pretty much the structure, which is you double check everything. Hydrogen should only have contributed one electron for sharing and carbon is contributing one electron for sharing for hydrogen because the maximum occupancy for hydrogen in terms of electron shell is only two. And then carbon must have eight electrons to stay stable. So as you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's the structure of ethene. Right, two electrons for hydrogen and then eight electrons for each carbon. Moving on to the next question, ethene can be converted to ethanoic acid by a two-stage process. In stage one, ethene is converted to ethanol by catalytic addition. Suggest why stage one is called an addition reaction. When you say it's addition, just like two plus three is five, you're referring to the product is only one. Okay, there's only one product. Two, a catalyst, sorry, a catalyst is used in stage one. State one other condition that must be used. So this is a catalytic conversion of ethene to ethanol by hydration. So you will need 60, what do you call that? 60 degrees Celsius. 
no, 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 not 60 degree Celsius, 60 atmospheric pressure and also 300 degree Celsius. Most textbooks will have these values. All right, so three, state what must be reacted with ethanol to form ethanoic acid. So conversion of alcohols to carboxylic acids require oxidation, right? So this will be taking, what's the reagent here? Acidified, potassium manganate seven. All right, this is an oxidizing agent. Moving on to the next question. Seven, carboxylic acids can be converted into esters. A, propanoic acid and methanol react to form an ester that has the molecular formula C4H8O2. One, name this ester and draw its displayed formula. So you're using methanol and propanoic acid. So the methanol is the first name, methyl. Propanoic acid contributes the second name, which is proper norwit. So the name of the ester is metal propanoid. How can we draw the structure? You can, if you can draw it straight away, I would encourage you to do that. But if you can't, you can start by drawing methanol first. So methanol is a three carbon, sorry, it's a one carbon. Due to the letter, sorry, the prefix meth, and then it has a hydroxyl group due to its family, which is it's an alcohol, and then propanoic acid. The word prop tells you that it has three carbon, and then because it's a carboxylic acid, it would have this particular structure C double O with an O H. All right, so fill in the blanks as usual with hydrogen atoms. Make sure that each carbon is covalently bonded, like it has four covalent bonds, including the ones with double bond. Double bond we consider as two, two single covalent bonds. So having that said, how does this occur? Well, it's a condensation process, which means that a water molecule will get removed and we can pretty much stick them together. So water is being removed and then here you go. The metal part is this side and the proper no weight part is this side. All right. Two, name another ester with the molecular formula C4H8O2. Well, you can simply just change the names, exchange the names by introducing propanol, which makes propyl, and then methanoic acid as methanoic. All right, moving on to B. Polyesters are polymers made from dicarboxylic acids. Why? Name the other type of organic compound used in the formation of polyesters. So essentially, it will be diols, right? Alcohols, diols. Okay. So two, name the type of polymerization used in the manufacture of polyesters. So polyesters are formed by, as you can see, this is a condensation polymerization. Okay, that's all for the past year. No, this is a specimen paper. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that it helps you with your exams. And if you enjoy this video, please do like and subscribe. And I'll be forever grateful. For that. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one.